alias Michael, who will always remain invisible to those on Earth and can be seen only by the 144,000 select Jehovah's Witnesses who rule with him from heaven. If you should choose to accept the Watchtower's current prophecy of Armageddon, whatever that may be, and decide to protect yourself by becoming a Jehovah's Witness, you will find yourself in a unique two-class religion. Only the upper class, the 144,000 spoken of in Revelation, are guaranteed a place in heaven, and they are known as the anointed. The Watchtower Society teaches that the vast majority of Jehovah's Witnesses constitute a secondary group referred to as the other sheep. They have no heavenly hope, but must remain on earth for all eternity. Once a year, on the anniversary of the Last Supper, Jehovah's Witnesses and invited persons gather for this communion-like ceremony. Only members of the anointed class who are alive today, about 9,000 worldwide, partake of the bread and wine. The millions of other sheep will not take communion. The other sheep are not in the new covenant and therefore have no personal relationship with Jesus Christ. How then do they hope to attain salvation? The Jehovah's Witness is told he may not look to Jesus alone for everlasting life. As one of the other sheep, he must also depend on the Watchtower organization for his passage to paradise. In turn, the organization says he's required to earn his salvation largely by calling door to door. It's strange, but they seem able to <clears throat> teach two different things, opposite things, simultaneously. They agree that the Bible teaches that we are saved by grace, or as they put it, God's undeserved kindness, and not by works. And yet the average witness believes, he hasn't the slightest doubt, that unless he performs the works that are laid out for him by the Watchtower Society, the witnessing activity, going door to door, um, regular meeting attendance, and other things that are brought out, that he will never gain everlasting life. Once in the organization, witnesses attend five hours of meetings a week. In addition, they are expected to devote many hours a month going door to door, selling literature and gaining converts, striving always to prove themselves worthy of escaping God's wrath at Armageddon. Even though we, we believe that God was love, we were always afraid that he was going to zap us, that sometime Armageddon might hit and we might not make it. Even if, even if we didn't go out from the door-to-door -door ministry on a weekend and took our family out, uh, out to the lake or something, we didn't go out from door-to-door, -door, we felt guilty all the time. In order to keep a close check on the activities of each member, the organization requires them to turn in a monthly time report if they want to be retained on the rolls as active Jehovah's Witnesses. We don't keep any membership records per se, but uh, the only record we have is those who actually go door to door preaching. Today, when the new Jehovah's Witness is baptized, rather than using the biblical format of baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. The witness is baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit-directed organization. This is a dedication to them that is without any reservation. They are now going to set their entire life aside to do their Creator's will. Thus baptized, the Jehovah's Witness is now committed to slave for the organization until the world comes to an end. Jehovah's Witnesses exist in a rigid, structured, thou shalt not environment. They are forbidden to vote or hold elective office, celebrate holidays, belong to the YMCA or YWCA, salute the flag, sing the national anthem, or participate in other patriotic activities. They can't serve in the military or work for a military organization. They may not accept blood transfusions, read anything critical of the Watchtower Society, or associate with former Jehovah's Witnesses. They are forbidden to even attend church. 
If life is narrow for the adult witness, the problem is greatly intensified for their school-aged children. The Watchtower Society has published a book entitled School and Jehovah's Witnesses. It defines for schools what activities witness children are forbidden to participate in. Things like birthday celebrations, Christmas and Easter, sports, Mother's or Father's Day, Valentine's Day or Thanksgiving, saluting the flag or school dances, singing the national anthem, or saying the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands. Children are real victims in this. Jehovah's Witness children cannot participate in many of the normal school activities and as a result are often mocked by their classmates. They are really torn because on one hand they want to please their parents and on the other hand they want to be accepted by their teachers and classmates. There is no way they can win. They are literally torn apart emotionally. I know this firsthand because my own daughter cried nearly every day in school from the first time she entered until an extremely loving teacher made her feel at ease in the fourth grade. The life of a witness child is very isolated because playing with non-witness schoolmates and neighborhood children is considered bad association. The Watchtower Society presents Jehovah's Witnesses as clean, happy, and unquestionably moral. The Bible has a lot to say about family life and the reason Jehovah's Witnesses have such happy families is because we try to apply the principles that are found in the Bible. This protects them from many of the pressures and the problems that afflict a family life today. For example, Jehovah's Witnesses, while not immune to the pressures and problems, are able to cope with the difficulties that husbands and wives face, that children are confronted with every day. And so we have a very low incidence of family dissolving or juvenile delinquency, drug abuse, and alcoholism. And that shows the benefit and the profit of following God's Word closely. Former Jehovah's Witnesses disagree. Growing up as a child within Jehovah's Witnesses, I always thought that this was God's clean organization. But when I got older, I found out that there were divorces, there was gross immorality within the congregations, and that we were actually no different than the ones we were condemning. As an elder, I saw the seedy side of the congregation. Members would come to me with their problems, and I found out that even elders were involved sometimes in crooked business practices and in immorality. And I began to discover that we were really no better than the people on the outside of the organization. When I left Bethel, it was hard for me to even share with my mother and father what was going on up there, the, the drunken parties that went on and, and the homosexuality and things like this. Finally, the Watchtower had to admit that immorality had spread to the highest levels of the organization, saying, shocking as it is, even some who have been prominent in Jehovah's organization have succumbed to immoral practices, including homosexuality, wife swapping, and child molesting. Alcoholism, depression, and mental disorders among Jehovah's Witnesses have come to the attention of psychiatric professionals. Dr. Jerry Bergman is a former Jehovah's Witness and a trained psychologist. In my experience in working for a number of psychiatric clinics as a therapist, I've worked with many, 